Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Jen Walling, the Executive Director of the Illinois Environmental Council, and I am very excited to invite you to the last of our Lunch and Learn series for the year. Um, you know, we started these uh, in March and held a lot of them right in a row, but we've been doing them monthly since, and we're really excited to maybe just do them on a monthly or biweekly basis next year. Um, we hope these sessions will keep us all connected during this difficult time. And we've made all the previous ones publicly available. This one will be on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, but just a little more on IEC, since our founding in 1975 by a group of dedicated grassroots environmentalists, IEC has led issue advocacy campaigns by allowing environmental organizations to pool their resources and create a higher profile for environmental issues. Today, IEC represents more than 90 environmental and community organizations and nearly 400 individual members throughout Illinois. Of course, if you're not already a member of IEC and are able to give, please consider joining today by using the link in the chat box. Um, and I'm actually not going to moderate today's panel because this one um, was the, the brainchild of Amanda Hanley, who um, just has an amazing background in um, investing and in um, funding of climate activism. I'm really excited to have her kick off today's panel. So. I'm gonna to toss it over to Amanda and then we're gonna start hearing from our panelists. Great, thank you, Jen. Hello, everyone, glad to be here. So I'm really excited that this talk is about using financial resources to compel change. As a climate activist, you might be wondering like what the heck am I doing talking about investing? Well, my involvement in this realm began in 2012 after attending Bill, McKibben, Bill McKibben's Do the Math Tour when he promoted fossil fuel divestment. Long story short, I helped instigate divestment at the University of Dayton, the first Catholic university to do so. And I've been involved with the movement ever since. Today, Divest Invest commitments have grown to a staggering $15 trillion in assets of universities, churches, pension funds, governments, and other organizations around the globe. Now, even Pope Francis is calling to divest from fossil fuels to speed the clean energy transition. Ripple effects from this finance-focused activism have disrupted business as usual for good. Greater awareness about needing to keep fossil fuels in the ground and stranded asset risk has shifted public discourse and demand. It has spurred more transparency and disclosure and accelerated green socially responsible investing. Shareholders have become more empowered to hold corporations accountable. Fiduciary duties have updated and a stakeholder economy is gaining steam. So as a climate solutions funder and an active overseer of my personal portfolio, it's essential that both grants and investments further my values, not undermine them. After weeding out fossil fuels and other bad actors and investing in ESG performers, I know this is not only possible, but financially sound. I'm thrilled we have some leading experts joining us here today to shed more light on investing with values. So first we'll hear from Illinois State Treasurer, Mike Frericks. I met him back in 2013 when a Sierra Club PAC held an event for him. While I was initially perplexed why Enviros were supporting a treasurer, Mike has shown why. Since elected, he's spearheaded the Sustainable Investing Act. Signed into law last year, it's the first state ESG bill in the country. In 2017, he released the first annual report that showcases an array of all the treasurer's sustainable investment activities. Today, he'll share more about safeguarding the state's $35 billion investment portfolio with the environment and social responsibility in mind. Next, Sylvia Panic will join in. Um, we originally connected through Women in Green and a Midwest Divest effort as she serves on the 350.org Chicago board. For her day job, Sylvia is a socially responsible investing advisor with Natural Investments here in Chicago. She's been in the field for more than 15 years, plus I love that she has a sustainability MBA. When it comes to financial planning and portfolio management, I can't stress enough how important it is to work 
with a smart, smart, responsive advisor that gets it. Today, Sylvia will talk about the basics of socially responsible investing and how people and organizations can get started. Last but not least, we will also hear from Andy Behar. He is the CEO of the nonprofit As You So, based in Berkeley, California. Named the top corporate watchdog of 2020, for nearly 30 years, As You So has led hundreds of successful corporate engagements from getting Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's to ditch 3 billion styrofoam cups every year to getting Kellogg's to stop spraying wheat and oats with carcinogenic pesticides. Andy literally wrote the book on shareholder action. Um, I'm a huge fan and in full disclosure, I serve on the As You So board. Today, he will demonstrate Invest Your Values transparency tools to help you discover what's lurking in your mutual funds. If you want to avoid fossil fuels, deforestation, gender inequality, weapons, private prisons, or tobacco, this is the go-to user-friendly resource. He will also share ideas on improving options for your 401k plan in your workplace. Um, afterwards, we'll open up Q&A for about 20 minutes to answer your questions. So with that, let's welcome Treasurer Mike Frerichs. Great, Amanda, thank you very much. Uh, Amanda, don't feel bad about wondering why uh, someone committed to the environment should be interested in a state treasurer. Uh, I was in the exact same place a little before meeting you. It was Jack Darren who actually encouraged me to run for the treasurer's office. I told him I liked the work I was doing in the state Senate. I thought it was more relevant. And he pointed out to me that there are things you could do in the treasurer's office to be helpful to the environment. And I think we have done that. Uh, I'll also take just one second to say hi to Andy. Uh, another reason that I do some of what I do uh, is my college roommate was John Goldstein. He said he lives just down the hill from you. And uh, John started Imprint Advisors, Imprint Capital Advisors several years ago. Still a resident of Berkeley. Uh, he was my college roommate for two years and best man at my wedding. So um, to tell you, Amanda, what we've done since we've come in office and why environmentalists should care about who the state treasurer is. I think someone is helping me with some slides here, but for the first time in our office's history, we are integrating environmental, social, and governance factors into our investment decisions. Not only does this help foster a business culture that is more attractive to structural trends, social impacts, and long-term growth, but it helps us better manage investment risks and improves investment performance. So I think we have a slide coming up here that shows some of the things we did before we were in office and things we do now. Uh, we were not, we did not have an investment policy standards. We do today. We did not integrate ESG factors and we do today. We were not voting our proxies on for corporations and we do today. Uh, we work with corporate engagements, we work with service providers. Uh, we uh, are investors in green and social bonds. Uh, and have gotten involved in many memberships and coalitions, some of which I'll try and mention to you. So the Illinois Sustainable Investing Act, which Amanda mentioned, we are the first in the nation. The effective date was January 1st of this year. What it does simply is stipulates that all state and local government entities that manage public funds should integrate material and relevant sustainability factors into their investment policies and processes. So this provides standardization institutionalization and prompts action for enhanced risk management, something that we think more companies ought to be doing. Now, the law is flexible enough that individual managers are able to adapt and customize how sustainability factors are considered to suit their investment programs. When we work with our money managers, we now evaluate all external investment managers by the quality of their ESG integration. For instance, we evaluate how do they integrate ESG factors into investment selection? What ESG factors do they prioritize? What level of staff experience expertise do they possess? What data do they collect? And how do they vote their proxies? And how do they conduct corporate engagement with portfolio companies? You know, it's one thing to just vote no, but we would like to work with them to have them make changes that are good for their company and for the environment. Now, many fund managers already integrate sustainability factors into their investment practice, as is common among asset managers such as BlackRock or Vanguard, State Street, Fidelity, UBS, and others. Nonetheless, oversight and due diligence is required 
to ensure that these managers are innovating and following best practices. What we don't want is someone to market themselves as a uh, green company. Uh, we are very cognizant of greenwashing. Uh, something where they just sort of apply a nice coat and say we're green friendly and they don't actually internalize and integrate this into their practices. Now we also take our corporate engagements very seriously. So when we're an investor in a company, we feel they should listen to us. We ourselves conduct engagement with many of the companies in which we invest. We seek an open dialogue and collaboration with these companies to encourage them to address sustainability risks and opportunities. So one example is a Southern company. It's one of the largest electric utilities in the nation and one of the top carbon emitters. We've been engaging Southern since 2018 with a large group of investors. So we work with Climate Action 100 Plus with support from Ceres and Majority Action. So we believe they're exposed to major regulatory and financial risk as the world transforms its energy mix. Carbon emission will become more expensive. Consumers, consumers will demand change. There'll be technology advances, advances and the economics of the industry are changing. So we are happy to report that As You So is also part of the engagement. They brought great expertise to the dialogue, particularly in pushing the company on its over-reliance on natural gas. So since 2018, we have succeeded and moved the company to set a goal of net zero carbon emissions for 2050, which is an important start. Uh, they're linking executive pay to carbon reduction goals. That brings accountability. And then increased transparency and disclosure on climate transition plans. Now, uh, we also do a lot of work with Vanguard. It's one of the largest investment managers in the world. It has enormous influence, encouraging companies to address climate risks and to reduce negative risk exposures. So Vanguard's proxy voting record on climate issues has been quite poor. Just last year in 2019, Vanguard supported only 7% of all environmental and social shareholder proposals in the US. We've been engaging with Vanguard and asking them to re-examine their voting stances and change their voting guidelines. Vanguard has signaled their readiness to modify their voting stances and to support more climate critical proposal starting next year. That's our job to hold them accountable and make sure they follow through. Now, we make investment decisions on the security or company level. And now uh, we use sustainability factors or incorporated into the overall decision-making process. This is with <clears throat> our debt issuers. In addition to traditional financial and technical analysis, we evaluate companies based on their exposure to environmental, social, and governance risks. And we think this provides an additional layer of factors to consider when assessing the risk value proposition investment decisions. We, I am proud to say, are the first ever public treasury to sign the Principles for Responsible Investment. We made history as the first ever US public treasury to become a member of the Principles for Responsible, Principles for Responsible Investment in 2018. Not only is it a milestone, it's an important step that strengthens our ability to protect and grow investment returns. The initiative was started by the United Nations and now includes over 3,000 global signatories among asset owners and managers. So PRI provides a reporting framework to optimize ESG integration and stewardship practices. And it also provides resources and tools to assist with this focus. I mentioned earlier green bonds. Uh, our office has invested $70 million in green bonds since 2017, which generate a strong investment return while also supporting positive environmental impacts, including renewable energy and energy efficiency. And these are the things Amanda talked about. When you make your investments, you wanna make sure they reflect your values. And the things I've run through right now, I believe that my personal values align with increasing and having sustainable value in our investments. So uh, I said to try and keep this short. Um, how about uh, we let some others speak and happy to answer any questions. Great, I think we're moving on to Sylvia. Um, so, go ahead. And uh, folks, folks can ask questions in the chat and we'll ask them all um, at the end. Excellent, thank you everybody. Let me just pull up and share my screen here. 
So I'm Sylvia Panic, a natural invest, uh, natural investments financial advisor, and uh, so we are a firm that's we're started about 30 years ago, and uh, our founding partners uh, wanted to do only sustainable and socially responsible investing on behalf of our clients. So 100%. And with that, we've learned a lot. We've grown with the industry and. Um, I feel lucky that uh, I get to be in Chicago and to see uh, the state of Illinois um, have such a progressive stance. And it's fantastic to see what uh, Treasurer Ferrix has been able to accomplish uh, over the past few years. So, um, but if you want to take it down to other organizations and individuals on how you align investments with your values, well, um, this is essentially, it's talking about investing in the kind of world that you want to see, right? Uh, purchasing a stock in a company, you know, having equity in a company is in some ways a consumer choice. So you can spend your time, let's say, going and buying organic produce at the grocery store um, or, you know, driving uh, a Prius, uh, putting solar panels in your house, and you're making all of these um, environmentally conscious, socially conscious purchases in your life. But if you're not thinking about where your retirement assets are going, where your investment assets, where you're banking, um, you could uh, unintentionally be still providing money to the companies that you've been avoiding, therefore kind of nullifying all of those good decisions that you made. So um, this is something that I feel is important for people to think about. And I wanted to sort of give an introduction to how um, to some of the basics and what Treasurer Frerix and after me, uh, Andy from As You So Foundation are going to talk about, they for the most part focus on the circle on the upper left hand side on corporate screening and shareholder action. So this is the part of the financial landscape where it's the companies like Apple, Walmart, uh, GE, um, that you can invest in, right? Or the mutual funds that invest in them. And so you'll go into Vanguard, um, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll screen the companies based on ESG. So ESG is this term, it's the environmental, social, and governance issues that the activities of a company can affect in the community. Um, and uh, so for it's important, uh, as it was pointed out, that there could be this sort of like veneer of greenwashing of corporations saying, yes, we're green, we do this. But um, as investors, you have this ability to screen out those that you don't want to invest in or to weigh them and compare them to their peers and to sort of invest in the, the best of the worst, so to speak. Um, something that sometimes people have problems with is that all these corporations that you see in the publicly traded market, um, to get to that size, um, uh, to register with the SEC and go public, issue their stock and bonds publicly, um, it was usually built off of this 19th, 20th century mentality around business, which ignored the negative consequences, right? The uh, environmental pollution, extraction of natural resources without you know, a care, um, exploitation of laborers and other communities. So um, it can be difficult to find a company which started with that in mind, um, keeping in mind the impact on the environment, keeping in mind an impact on people and society in general. So what we tend to find is that um, in this upper left-hand corner, this bubble, um, with a publicly traded market, you have to go through that engagement process as an investor, as a shareholder, where you own shares in the company um, to encourage them to do better. So Treasurer Frerix talked about it, Andy after me is gonna talk about it, um, but I, don't, I also wanna bring to mind these other two circles that natural investments considers in the sphere of sustainable and responsible investing, which also includes community development finance. Uh, banking, depository banks, where you have a che checking and savings accounts. So are you with a bank that tends to finance um, in, uh, uh, oil pipelines, uh, coal mining, um, natural gas fracking? And if that's something that you don't want to have your money used and leveraged towards to finance, then consider a community development bank or credit union. 
um, and there's hundreds, if not thousands across the country. Um, and that money um, is used and leveraged towards things are, such as um, small business loans, uh, uh, community project financing, um, low uh, affordable housing mortgages and such, um, as well as on an international scope, microfinance, um, the idea of small lending to uh, in developing countries, um, you know, a loan of $20 or even $100 can um, give someone uh, access to credit. Uh, and so being able to, to be a part of that financial landscape is uh, a bit more of the change that we're seeking in the world, right? Um, and finally, this lower, um, this third bubble on the bottom um, in terms of regenerative sustainability, high impact focused investments is what at natural investments we tend to refer to as the, uh, the private space. So these are uh, companies and funds that aren't necessarily um, uh, publicly traded. You can't log into a, a brokerage account and you know buy and sell and have, find a ticker symbol. So you go directly to the company and you invest in them. Um, uh, it tends to be more at the organization institutional level, but it is possible for individual investors to do that as well. And you don't necessarily have to um, be a high net worth person. So um, it just takes some research, it takes some due diligence and or finding um, a financial advisor who's able to find those for you, if that's something that you're passionate about. Um, in terms of the process, um, for an organization, um, we talk to them about where are you banking um, and where do you have your access to credit. So we encourage them to take a look at uh, community development financial institutions. Um, it's a certification process managed by the U.S. Treasury, and uh, they look and they make sure that this that this CDFI. Uh, actually has most of its lending and service operations in low to middle income communities around the US and they go through an audit process. Um, so you can sort of trust that what they're doing is what they say they're doing. Uh, credit unions might not be a certified CDFI, but credit unions by their just um, status of incorporation, they are technically nonprofits. They are uh, financial cooperatives, uh, so membership financial cooperatives, um, where um, when you're a member of the credit union, you uh, you have a vote for the board of directors. Um, it's a nonprofit, so most of the profits have to go back into the service of the membership. So that's something for you to consider. And then we talk to them about um, their investment. Uh, who is managing their investments for them, uh, the wealth manager and or a consultant that they might hire with experience in sustainable and socially responsible investing um, to then help create an investment policy statement, which takes a look at traditional guidelines as to um, what sort of assets and what sort of risk you take with your investments for the, for the organization. Um, and then you can incorporate language in there that talks about um, the ESG, the environmental, social, and corporate governance criteria thresholds that you sort of expect your investments to be investing in or not investing in. Um, uh, and on top of that, finally, uh, if an organization has employees, then you uh, want, might want to consider um, including SRI options or only having SRI options as a part of the retirement plan. And Andy after me will go a little bit more into that. Um, when you take a look at just uh, yourself as an individual, it's largely pretty much the same formula. So you take a look at your checking and your savings accounts um, with your investments. There's resources out there, and I'll provide them in just a minute for you to be able to do it yourself. Or if you need a financial advisor, um, I'll provide some resources as to where you can sort of find one that might align with your values. And unfortunately with uh, your firm's retirement plan, you don't have control over what you're able to invest in, but um, you can advocate for your company, um, for your organization to add options. And so it's just a bit of a uphill um, discussion process for you to consider. So with all of these sort of um, uh, avenues, banking, investments, um, private, publicly traded, 
um, assets. Here are a couple of resources for you to take a look at. And this meeting is being recorded, so you can flip back to it later when um, the, the Illinois Environmental Council makes it uh, publicly available. So we don't need to dwell on it too much. Um, but I will point out US CIF is the trade association, uh, the business association for financial professionals. Um, so you can find uh, wealth managers and financial advisors in there uh, and resources um, talking about SRI in depth. Uh, Green America Business Network is a good resource as well, um, as well as B Corp benefit corporations. So, um, and with that, I will let Andy take over. Stop sharing. There we go. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Andy Behar, the CEO of As You Sow, and Amanda, thank you for setting this up. Really appreciate it. And happy to give everybody a tour of some of the tools that we've developed. Um, just a little background about <clears throat> how these evolved. So As You Sow is a nonprofit based in Berkeley, California. We've been around since 1992, so almost 30 years. And we focus on corporate accountability. So most of our work is direct engagement with companies. Um, so we give companies, a, we send companies a letter, we give companies a call as shareholders to talk about material issues. And because uh, shareholders have legal standing as on material issues, we can ask them questions about climate change, about environmental health, about human rights. And so we do. Last year we talked, we had 131 engagements with companies and some of those, the company said, great, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to now work on, on changing our policies and practices. Others didn't, and those we escalate to file a shareholder resolution. So uh, about 70 of those we escalated to a shareholder resolution that then proceeds with the, the work with the companies and eventually goes to a vote. And basically, we, we got four majority votes last year, and most of the companies agreed. We withdrew many of them as the companies agreed to the changes. So. That's, that's, that's most of our work, but another part of our work is around fossil fuels, in particular fossil fuel divestment. And when we got into that, what we found is that all these people wanted to divest fossil fuels, but nobody knew what they owned, like literally. Um, we found that just very, very few people understood the structure of their own investments and the power of their own investments. And so we developed these tools, and I'm gonna share a screen, um, that started, this was about, um, five years ago, give me one second here. Um, let me just call this up, there it is. And can you all see um, the As You So website now? I'm assuming. Um, so this is, this is the As You So website. And if you just scroll down a little bit, um, it's not scrolling, it's having a little trouble. There we go. You come to this area called invest your values. And whoops. And what you have here is seven different ways you can enter the site. You can either go through fossil fuels, gender equality, guns, deforestation, weapons, tobacco, or prisons. I'm going to go in through fossil free. Now, you have to understand what a mutual fund is. And in simple terms, it's a basket of stocks. It could be 20 stocks. It could be 3,000 stocks if you own the Russell 3000. So you could go in here and you could type the name of a fund family. So for instance, Vanguard is a fairly um, uh, well-known fund and many people in their 401k plans or 403b plans have Vanguards. So this Vanguard stock, we then broke it down because people were also confused about what is a fossil fuel. So some, and I'm gonna show you some funds in a minute that are fossil fuel free yet have 42 fossil fuel companies in them. So you gotta be very careful about the names of things. So the first thing we looked at was what's called the Carbon Underground 200. So these are the 100 largest oil and gas companies and the 100 largest coal companies. So you can see that this particular fund owns Exxon and Chevron and Conoco and all of those. And you can see exactly the percentage and the dollar amount. But we might want to go a little deeper. So what about coal companies? Well, this fund also owns First Energy and all these other coal companies. What about fossil fired utilities? So um, a lot of people who were divesting, they were divesting from the Exxons of the world, the big oil companies, but they still held 
the Dukes, the Southerns, and, and uh, the treasurer mentioned Southern Company. We engage with Southern Company also and have for about a decade. Um, so own all these fossil fired utilities, which are creating the most emissions, but they weren't aware of it. So this will show you exactly what's inside your, your mutual fund. Another way to look at it is what's the carbon footprint? So we aggregate the emissions for every company in the fund, divide by the dollar amount. And so you see this number, this is 70 tons of carbon per million dollar US. So that way we can compare this fund to any other fund and you can see it benchmarked against all these other funds. Now, another way to think about climate change is what impact do I have the companies in my portfolio, are they burning down the Indonesian and the Amazon rainforest? So we're looking now through a lens of deforestation. So we have, a, we have companies flagged that are involved in palm oil, paper pulp, rubber timber, cattle, and soy. And this is a, this is a list of companies that our partners, Friends of the Earth, maintain. They put this together. And they update this as companies buy and sell, do mergers and acquisitions. And we update this entire site once a month. So all the holdings of all these mutual funds are, are as current as, as you can get. So you can see ADM and Tyson, you can see Hormel. So these are the companies that are literally involved with the destruction of the rainforest. What about the banks that are funding all these companies? Well, um, this biggest section is going to be JP Morgan. They are the number one destructive bank on the planet. Bank of America, of course, Citigroup and Morgan Stanley. And then of course the consumer brands. So if you own a company that makes potato chips and cooks them in palm oil, that's a company you might not want to own. Um, and you can see all the companies that are purchasing the actual materials from deforestation. Now, if you wanna go and, and you can see each company. So for instance, ADM, you can see that they do palm oil and soy and, and a little description about, you know, about who they are, what they do and how they do it. So, you can get into a great, great depth here. And I'm giving you a very high level over the next couple of minutes. If you care about weapons, or sorry, this is a prison industrial complex. We just added this recently in August. People, you know, during this, this, this uprising on in racial justice are wondering, do I own the manifestation of racist policy? And so you can see if you click on prison industry and you go see all, you can see that you do own, in fact, Core Civic, the world's largest private prison company, and you also own Geo Group, the number two. This data is gathered by the American Friends Services Committee, the Quakers, who have been working on the issue about incarceration for literally over a hundred years. So they are our partners, our data partners, um, you know, for this. We also look at border security, so you can see what which companies are involved with. Um, with border security. And you're gonna see a lot of banks. You're gonna see Microsoft and Amazon. You're gonna see JP Morgan, of course, Bank of America. So you get a sense of what's inside that. Now, another way to look at it is gender equality. This fund happens to score a little bit better for gender equality. Now we work with a group called Equileap that is doing the data gathering and they provide us with 19 key performance indicators. So they're evaluating 3,000 companies on issues like living wage, gender pay gap, parental leave. Um, this is issues around recruitment strategy. This is like, and also around safety at work, sexual harassment policies, um, women in the workforce. Do you have women on the board, executive senior management? So they're really getting into the, the deep details of this. I wanna show you another way you can, you can look at this, at this data. If you go to search funds, you come to uh, another page, this is a little bit more advanced. So for instance, you can click on financial performance. We've now sorted all the funds by financial performance. And if you click here five years, now we've just resorted it by five-year financial performance. If you click on search settings, you can say, I only want diversified funds, which means leaving out all the themed funds like a pharmaceutical fund or a real estate fund. So a fund that's got a blend and then you can say, I only want to have, I got to get an A grade for fossils and I got to get a B grade for deforestation and I want an A for gender. You can, you can add in all your, uh, your factors and then you can go look across all the issues. Like how does each one of these, now again, these are all performing at a very high level. So these are plus 26%. These are the highest um, in terms of the five year, we've sorted by five year returns. And another way you can do it is you could check a few of them. You could check, um, four of them, up to, up to four. 
and you can do a comparison. So a side by side, you can see everything about them. You can see their grades. And then you can also see their financial performance, who's outperforming um, who. So again, you start to, to look around, you start to see these different funds. And it's very interesting if you look in your 401k plan and start to grade all of the ones that your companies have offered you. Now, what we find often is companies sustainability goals are very different than what they're offering their employees. An example is Amazon, very good on climate in terms of electric vehicles, moving their data centers onto renewables and promoting it wildly. I mean, their, their marketing is all around climate, yet every Amazon employee has no choice but to buy coal-fired utilities, big oil. They just don't know it. And that's the thing is that there's this ignorant complicity. We are all part, we look at the world and we say, why is the climate destroyed? Why do we have ocean plastics? Why is our social fabric torn? Well, we're part of it. We own all the companies that are doing these things. We're just not aware of it. It's hidden from view by Wall Street. They do this quite, um, I think, with, with great intention, and we're trying to shine a light on it. An example is I'm going to show you the, this is a fossil-free, fossil-free um, ETF, yet they have Carbon Underground 200 companies. They have two of them. They have coal companies. They have fossil-fired utilities. So they, and, and we, we, we sued them um, to about this. And what the SEC told us is, no, they're allowed to do that. That basically, if you have less than 20%, you can call it. So you can have a pharmaceutical free fund that's 19% Pfizer. That's just the way the rules work, the way the language works. And so defining fossil free, what it means for you is that's critically important. Understanding your power as an investor to move your money now, when you're in a 401k plan, you can only move it between funds that your that your company offers you, or if you like, we we provide empowerment tools um, to help you to. Um, it's over here someplace. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, so we we've got a whole section here on on to help you to 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 speak to your. Um, let me see. Well. Oh yeah, fossil fuel action toolkit. So this will help you if you want to change the way your 401k plan is uh, is built. It gives you advice, like how do you do it? You talk to your colleagues, you build a coalition, you identify who to speak to at the company. You bring your solution to the table in a positive way. You want to sit down with your 401k administrator and say, "There's nothing I can invest in. Help me out." Now the other thing is, and we give a sample letter to plan administrators. Another thing you're going to find is interesting um, is if you look at, um, well, let me go, let me just show you here just so you kind of get the idea. If you go here and like you look at SPY, so SPY is the S&P 500. Um, if you were to click on SPY and SPYX, where is it? SPYX, um, oh, it's SPY. X and SPY, if you're going to do a comparison of these two, what you're going to find is that one of them is one of them is without fossil fuels, but the one without fossil fuels is going to outperform. And I don't, I'm, I've gone a little long here, but if you compare, you could compare the ACWI, the All World Index, with CRBN, which is the All World Index without oil. The ones without oils, oil are, are outperforming right now because the fossil fuel industry has been underperforming the whole market for the last decade. So you can make that case to your 401k administrator that this is the, uh, the path that you would like. You'd like to have some fossil free added to your 401k plan. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up because I know I only have a little bit of time, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And all of this is available. It's free. It's, uh, we, again, we update it once a month and, um, and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, Amanda, did you want to, we do have a ton of questions, but do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, I, again, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I, I'll just start off questions. I'm wondering if you can just each just share maybe one piece of advice on how to start investing for good or dispel one common myth that prevents people from doing so. 
I mean, Sylvia, for me, uh, okay, or Andy, you've got the floor. Then sure. We'll, do. well, the one myth that people believe is that they have to give up profits, they have to give up outperformance when they choose to invest align with their values. And this could not be further from the truth that actually ESG companies that, that, that have environmental, social, and governance policies and practices tend to be companies that have better management, have reduced their risk. And so overall, it's, it's, it's just a myth, that's all, that you do not have to give up any performance if you choose to invest aligned with your values. That, that's, I think, the number one myth. Uh, I'll just say as an institutional investor, when I hang out with the National Association of State Treasurers, uh, there's a belief by some people, normally on the other side of the political aisle from me, uh, that what we're doing here is we're pushing our values uh, on these companies. And they say your job as a fiduciary, uh, your job is to uh, try and uh, get good returns, not to push your liberal values. I tell them that's, I completely agree with you. I think it's just a very fortunate coincidence that when we're trying to push for long-term value in these companies, sustainable growth that will produce returns for years to come in our pension funds, and our college savings funds, it just so happens to align with my personal values. Overcoming that has been difficult with, uh, with many of my colleagues, especially those on the other side of the aisle. Uh, I'll jump in and I'll add that I think another myth that tends to be pervasive is that there aren't many options, that you can't have diversified portfolio um, when you're looking at building something that's more sustainable and socially responsible and that that is no longer the truth. Um, maybe about a couple of decades ago, it was difficult, but um, with demand from society and from investors, um, uh, the there have been products that have been coming out that do this, that are, you know, either completely fossil fuel free or, you know, free of the prison industrial complex. Um, as Andy pointed out, if you look at any of those tools, they have very several different themes that you can take a look at and you can sort and find um, mutual fund products out there that um, will align with your values and you can look at their performance and, um, and see that you have options. So building a diverse portfolio um, is possible. So we're not just stuck to, you know, um, there was something that a mentor of mine said, you know, in response to somebody saying, well, if you're eliminating all these companies, you have a smaller universe to invest in. You can't be, have a diverse portfolio. And she came back to him and she said, listen, you know, this is like, if you have a deck of cards and I have all of the high value face cards, you know, the king, the queen, the jack, uh, and ace, uh, then I, and those are what is in my deck, I'm picking the best of the best. So, um, you know, it just it really depends on how you look at it. Thanks, Sylvia. So um, there's a ton of questions and I know Colleen got some sent to her too. Um, let's actually start with one for Treasurer Frerichs. Um, and Kim Stone had asked, how can we extend sustainable investing guidelines to our pension funds, both at the local level and with statewide funds? Well, that's a great question. That's why last year we led in pushing the Illinois Sustainable Investment Act, which says that all public funds must integrate ESG policy, ESG, ESG, ESG factors into their investment policies. Now we left them great flexibility about how to interpret that. Uh, but we thought this was a good first step and it was, a, it was the first step we could make. We actually encouraged them to go a little further and receive a lot of pushback. And so that's our first step. Uh, once they integrate them, once they're forced to think about these factors, I think it's going to make sense for a lot of people. Uh, I've gone and spoken in front of police and fire pension boards over the last few years. And a lot of those trustees are skeptical of anything with ESG in the title. That E scares a lot of them off. And they say, oh, we don't, we don't see the value in that. But I've explained some of our uh, governance or societal issues. Uh, we've made it very clear to them that this is all about reducing risk. And they understand risk, they understand it's their job as a fiduciary to reduce risk. We're just telling them there are risks associated with climate. And uh, I think once they have to think about them before making decisions, you're gonna see some changes in attitudes and we'll go back next few years and uh, tighten the Sustainable Investing Act. And I don't know if, I, I think I'll just keep going because there are more questions too that others can answer, but 
Um, uh, Jessica had asked, is the first co-op in DuPage County Prairie Food Co-op co is going to be offering an investment opportunity in spring 2021. Um, IC has been very supportive of uh, food cooperatives and the Cooperative Act. Um, what is the best way to connect with financial advisors in Illinois that might want to connect us with their clients? And I think maybe Sylvia, um, you had some resources on that that you displayed. Do you want to answer that one? Um, so when it comes to a direct investment into uh, something smaller, like a food cooperative, um, it will depend on the advisor. So it sounds like you're going to have to do some um, hard hitting of the pavement and approaching them and discussing with them and having meetings and sitting down and explaining the investment opportunity. Um, advisors take their responsibility seriously. Um, and it depends on um, if they have the time and if they're willing to go into something like that, that's outside of the publicly traded space um, with their clients. So uh, other than that, I can, if you wanna contact me directly, we can have an offline conversation. So, but there is no easy way to get that kind of buy-in. It really is just going to each firm individually. Yeah. Um, I think um, I think Andy answered this, but how do I mitigate potential exposure to fossil fuel investments when I invest in a broad-based diversified index ETF? This one was asked early on, so I think you answered this. Um, but do you want to comment a little more there? Um, basically, you got to look it up on our site. It's the only way to really see it. But if you have a broad-based ETF, if you've got an index, you're going to have fossil fuels. Now they could be underweighted, so. Just, just understand an index is like the S&P 500. It's, in, it's this basket of, of 500 stocks, but a fund manager could weight, them, weight any stock to zero. It's still an index, even if you weight certain companies down to zero or weight them very, very small. You know, when coal was doing its, its massive decline, everybody was starting to underweight it in, within the indexes. So it's not just a... It, there, there, there is, there's many S&P 500 indexes and, and there are differences between them. So, um, but the thing is that there's also indexes without oil, like SPYX is the State Street version of the S&P 500 without big oil. Now, when they first came out with it, they called it the Fossil Free Index. We challenged them on this and they changed the name to the Fossil Reserve Free Index because they still had coal-fired utilities. They didn't, they just were taking out basically the carbon underground 200, so the biggest oil companies. So we had, we challenged them, they actually renamed it. Um, actually, Amanda was involved with that because we were at the opening party at the Paris um, Climate Conference where they announced SPYX and we had a list of all the fossil fuels in it. And we were like, what the heck's going on? And uh, anyway, that uh, just, you gotta be careful. You gotta actually look what's inside. And that's, that's the key. Great. So. Um, anybody, Sylvia or others, want to add to um, that answer? Nope, I think Andy covered it. Yeah, and I guess there's also, do you have a list of Vanguard mutual funds that you would recommend for any organizations or as individuals to consider for retirement funds? Like who is doing great work? Vanguard's a little tough, and I've had this question many times. I just did a talk at, where is it, the World Bank or a company that... Um, People are kind of shocked when they you actually look inside. I like I did I actually just did a talk at the World Bank and they asked me to look at their 401k plan and we did and I showed them that a lot of them were invested in cluster munitions and landmines. Now, that's a big issue for the World Bank and they were all kind of shocked. And um, we looked at the they were very proud about this Vanguard Sustainable Fund, but it it gets F's and D's on about I think four of our seven metrics. So. Vanguard's got a lot of work to do. They just don't offer, uh, they just don't offer really anything ESG at the moment. BlackRock's doing a lot of work now. They're coming out with some ESG funds. But on the other side of it, there are incredible funds that really with, that have brilliant theses and have really done the research and have been around for a decade. The PAX Elevate Women's Fund focuses on, on, on gender and it's, um, it outperforms the market. It's, I mean, just you, there's these in every single category. If you click on the button on prison free funds, it'll take you to the ones that are the cleanest for prisons, the one that's cleanest for, for deforestation. Um, there are many funds that are, you can put together a portfolio 
if you're not restricted by a 401k, if you just have your own IRA, you can put together a portfolio that gets straight A's and you can put side by side with, with anything else. And, and you can see that it's uh, solid, been around for a long time and has Andy, good performance. Yeah. Can I ask, <laughs> as a presenter, I'm asking you, um, does, do your tools, um, do they look at proxy voting as we're gonna well? Be adding, we're going to be adding that actually. That's one of our it's on our list this year to add how the family votes. So we know Vanguard votes against like every climate resolution. Left. That's a lot of- <laughs> Well, maybe not this year, but it's in our next, is our next iterative cycle. It's, no. it's been on our list. We just haven't, just so you understand, we built this tool over five years with tiny little, like hundreds of little grants. We're, we can't build, we build it out phase by phase because we're a nonprofit. So we have to get a grant to do each little piece of this. So. Mm -hmm. Each feature, we got to find funding. And so, uh, but proxy voting is on there because yeah, people want to know that BlackRock votes basically, you know, against yeah. every climate resolution and they vote for every egregious CEO pay package. And that should be part of your evaluation. So yeah, that's- Right, it will I have come, that with clients yeah. who ask about some of the major funds that they're currently invested in with their current advisor. Um, and, you know, they'll be like, oh, it's an ESG fund and all of this. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, and this is where you start to take a look at, but how are they voting the proxies? And I walked a client through one of the major funds and I'm not going to name who, but when you took it, when you took a look at how they were voting every single time there was an ESG type resolution up, they voted against it. Mm -hmm. Like 98 out of hundred instances. And so this is where you're like, you're not walking the talk. You know, you say uh, that you're, you know, trying to be response, socially responsible and so environmentally conscious and in how you're building these funds. But then when resolutions come up at company meetings and you say, mm, we don't need a report on gender pay disparity, you know, or anything like that, then many, many of them say many of them say we're engaging. So an example, we filed with Monster Beverage on slavery and supply chain and we, and ISS, this is a proxy advisor, said vote for it. And we got a 20% phone. We went back and looked at who voted for and against and BlackRock voted against it. The back Black actually like endorsed slavery in their supply chain. And we went and asked them, said, why? And they said, well, we talked to the company. And we said, well, if you did, why didn't you tell us if, if they were gonna do something, we would have withdrawn. So no, we, that's all confidential. We can't share any of that information. And that's how BlackRock interacts with the whole the whole ecosystem of shareholder advocacy, which is they don't tell us anything and they vote against everything that we're doing. And so it's not, I, they, they could do a much, much better job. Yes, I, I'll just add that uh, Larry Fink wrote a nice letter. I was very happy to read that. It got a lot of attention, uh, but if, you don't, if, he doesn't, if he doesn't follow it up with actions, it's, it's essentially greenwashing. He had some nice statements about uh, other shareholders, other uh, uh, responsible parties here that we need to consider. Uh, but yeah, uh, with them and Vanguard, we think they made progress, but it has been awfully slow and not enough. Yeah, they, and they also signed the business roundtable, new purpose of a corporation. So they signed on to stakeholder capitalism. We filed a resolution with them about that because we said, you've committed to taking care of employees and your customers and your community and your supply chain, yet, you're voting the opposite way. Why? How do you, how do words become actions? Was the question, and we presented it at the annual meeting this year, and we will present it again next year. So, yeah, I, it is a really, it's a big question. They, they use, they have an immense amount of power, but they don't use it in in a way that's really effective. If I can just add, um, I'm just so excited that As You So has these free investor values tools because they are like blaring a spotlight on all of these things that none of us know and that we need to know otherwise it won't change. Um, and um, one last thing with ESG, it's not like this edgy newfangled thing. It really has become mainstream. I mean, USF has now said um, $17 trillion in assets, one third are devoted to ESG and and as um, and shareholder action. So this is this is really the way to go. And um, I'm really grateful that all of the folks are on this panel, kind of pushing the ball up the hill because we need it. Yeah. 
So I think with that, um, I think we've answered most of the questions in here, but you know, one of the things that um, from Illinois Environmental Council that we like to make sure um, is that, you know, there's both individual actions that people can take, but if we can get this to become easier for everybody, and I know there's some market development that happens, but um, what are some policy advocacy items that people can ask their elected officials to do that would make this easier for um, individuals to have access or uh, easier for this to be just the default option? I know, you know, Treasurer Ferg, she's talked about the act that was passed. Um, what's the next step there? And actually, why don't, why don't you start, Treasurer, and um, where, we, where do we need to go next and how can we help you? Well, great. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from municipalities out there that felt that their pension funds, they wouldn't have flexibility. That this might force them to make investments that wouldn't get a good return. But as you've heard from Sylvia and Andy, uh, that's just not the case. Uh, these funds tend to outperform. We've seen here during uh, coronavirus, when the market took a downturn, those that integrated ESG were prepared, were better prepared for these shocks and outperformed. Um, so it's one spreading the news and letting people know that this is uh, responsible. It's a responsible use of taxpayer dollars, not necessarily because it aligns with our values, but it's a way of producing long-term sustainable value for companies. Uh, so our intent is after uh, some of more of these funds are used to this, feel more comfortable with this, to go back to the General Assembly. At that point, we'll call upon groups like IEC that's done great works lobbying in Springfield uh, to help us push that next step. Thank you. So Sylvia or Andy, you wanna add anything? Well, the ERISA rules that were just passed are yes. directly in the face of all this. They, they're they basically, the Department of Labor has a lot of fear around people actually moving their money into alignment with their values. And so they tried to block it and they came out with this rule. That's gonna take some energy to undo. The SEC is also trying to block shareholder advocacy, trying to take away the voice of shareholders and to, um, and basically what that's led to is an escalation. Um, I can tell you it as you so, since, they, since the SEC passed the rules, we have been escalating into litigation, into binding resolutions, into just a whole range of other options. So, this new administration, the new SEC, they're gonna, they're, they've got a lot of work to undo um, some new rules, some new guidelines that have now been woven into the fabric of decision-making, uh, threatening fund administrators uh, and, and 401k administrators, you know, with potentially um, breach uh, lawsuits that frankly, we've never seen. I mean, this is the other thing. Everybody's all afraid of having this breach of fiduciary duty, but there's never been a case. There's never been a case brought to a judge. So um, yeah, we got to undo some of the stuff that's happened over the last few years. Ditto. Sylvia, do you want to let The only left? thing I'll add is, you know, take this opportunity while it's fresh in your mind. And while we're mostly going to be stuck during this pandemic uh, at home during a cold winter to take a look at some of the resources that we provided here today um, and try to transition to a better bank, um, better investment portfolio, uh, encouraging a better um, employee retirement plan at your workplace uh, and, and sharing it with others. And, and, you know, when you're stuck at home. Great. Well, I just want to say a big thank you. This was such an interesting and informative panel and we'll share the recording on our websites um, and on our YouTube channel. Just really want to thank Amanda for the awesome idea on our uh, last topic of the year, um, but also to Andy Bayer, Treasurer Ferrix, um, and Sylvia Panic for joining us today. We'll, we'll share all these resources, um, put it up. Uh, and for those of you who are members of IEC, we do have a couple of special members only um, lunch and learns next week. So look for those emails in your inbox. Um, and uh, definitely encourage you to join so you can see more things like this because we are uh, a nonprofit organization as well. Um, but thank you um, so much. And we look forward to activating all of you on um, really making this the default option for our communities and for us as individuals. So thanks everybody for joining. This is a great attendance. Talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda.